Hello, everyone. Happy Monday, and welcome to CEPR, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of CEPR, and I'm so happy that you are here with us today and to welcome our speaker, Professor Natasha Saran. Natasha will be talking about an agency that nearly every American adult needs to deal with one way or another each year, the Internal Revenue Service. Love it or hate it, there's clearly a lot of room for improvement at the IRS. Natasha will be talking us through the needs for increased funding so the IRS can modernize its technology, hire a robust and efficient workforce, and create a better agency. She's been doing work on this area for a few years now, and especially with the Treasury Department, to figure out how the IRS could best crack down on tax evasion. President Biden uh, signed legislation that added about $80 billion to IRS funding as a part of the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, hoping that boost would allow the agency to recover as much as $400 billion over the next decade in taxes that would otherwise be unpaid, primarily from the wealthiest Americans. But that comes after years of congressional budget trimming, and the IRS saw its enforcement staff decline by approximately one-third from 2010 to 2021. Fewer employees mean fewer audits, and fewer audits mean not as many chances to recover taxes that should have been paid. Higher audit probabilities also influence behavior, making people and companies more likely to comply. The so-called tax gap has most recently been estimated at about $688 billion, though there's a big confidence interval around that number. But increased funding for the IRS has also attracted doubts and lots of criticism. Some people argue that the agency can't be trusted with more money and more power, while others question how far the new money would actually go to help the agency. Most recently, uh, members of the House have proposed cuts to the IRS in the bill uh, included with aid for Israel and Ukraine. Related to this, one of our own faculty, Professor Dan Ho, who is one of our senior fellows at CEPR, produced a very influential study earlier this year that showed the IRS was inappropriately auditing black taxpayers at higher rates than other racial groups. The IRS then conducted some of its own internal reviews and confirmed his results and vowed to make improvements, and those are apparently underway. That's just one example of how CEPR research can have a direct impact on policy, and this topic is one that really hits home with our mission. Uh, raising taxes are obviously it's pretty core to everything that government does because it funds so much of what uh, schools and defense and so forth. Here at CEPR, we're a community of more than 100 faculty who are generating data-driven research with an eye to improving economic policies throughout the US and abroad. And it's very important for us to convene policymakers, business leaders, and academics for conversations about economic policy. Natasha is really a terrific guest for us to have because she has spanned multiple areas, not only academia, but also policy. And I'm honored to give her a a prop, an introduction, but I am not going to spend the whole next hour talking about her many accomplishments. Uh, right now, Natasha is an associate professor of law at Yale Law School with a secondary appointment at the Yale School of Management in the Finance Department. As I alluded to earlier, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and later as a counselor to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen at the U.S. Treasury Department, where her work focused on narrowing the gap between the taxes owed by the American public and those collected by the IRS. Just a few weeks ago, she testified to the Senate Budget Committee about the importance of adequately funding the IRS and the budgetary impact of the agency's efforts to pursue tax evasion. Prior to her government service, Sarah was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Cary Law School and at the Wharton School of Business. Her research centers on public finance and financial regulation with work on tax policy, household finance, insurance, and macro prudential risk management. And she will actually be visiting, presenting some of her academic research next door at the economics department tomorrow. After Natasha's remarks, I'll ask her a few follow-up questions, and then we'll open things up to your questions in the audience. Again, it's a tremendous honor to have Pro Professor Natasha Saran here with us today. So please join me in welcoming her to CEPR. Uh, well, thanks so much to Mark for that exceptionally kind introduction and also for having me here. Uh, I'm really excited to be here 
talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, uh, which is the need for investment in the IRS and what I think the $80 billion that the Inflation Reduction Act delivered the agency is delivering already for taxpayers and likely to deliver in the years ahead. Uh, as Mark kind of already made clear, I should say at the outset that I'm not exceptionally impartial on this topic. Uh, even before my time at the Treasury Department, I spent a substantial portion of my academic life making the case for the need to invest in the IRS and revitalize the agency uh, and the importance of addressing some of the inequities that I'll talk about today that exist in our system of taxation. Uh, in the government, my job primarily over the first year and a half of my tenure was really about making the case for the legislation that ultimately became a small part of the Inflation Reduction Act, but is a really significant sort of accomplishment from the IRS's perspective with this historic influx of mandatory funding that's going to enable the agency to modernize, which is something it hasn't been able to do in at least the last 50 years of its history. Uh, after the Inflation Reduction Act was passed last August, I spent the last time, the last several months of my time in government working very closely with the IRS as they developed a strategic plan to think about actually how to implement against these new resources. Uh, and it was a pretty remarkable experience. I know that there are some students here today, so one thing that I wanted to be sure to say is that I learned more in my two years in government than I have at any other point in my professional career. And I really think that, especially for people who are interested in policy, there's a really substantial case to be made for taking the opportunities to serve when they present themselves, because mine, at least, was pretty remarkable. Um, part of my job when I was at the IRS involved traveling to IRS submission processing centers around the country. Uh, and that was the kind of objective was for me to learn about how the IRS works and why the IRS so desperately needed resources. Uh, and before the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the agency was in truly dire straits. COVID proved this like perfect storm for the IRS, which what had happened was the IRS hadn't modernized tax processing in any real way over the course of the last 50 years. What that means is when people file by paper, as some people choose to do, what happened at the IRS and still happens today is that literal IRS employees circle line items by hand with red pens. They, red pens are like a very high priority item for IRS employees. They circle line items by hand, and then they hand tax returns to another IRS employee, who then hand transcribes line items from those tax returns into IRS databases. There are people whose entire jobs at the IRS consist of manually removing staples from tax returns because the agency couldn't afford staple removers. People whose entire job at the IRS consist of standing next to scanners because the scanners are so, so old that they jam. And so what needs to happen is someone has to stand there every time it jams and jigger it so that it unjams. And you know, I spent a lot of my time before I went into government kind of saying, how could it be the case that we fail to collect 15% of taxes that are owed, that the tax gap is so large, it totals over $600 billion annually? And I will say, after watching this, I was kind of shocked that we managed to collect 85% of the taxes that are owed because the system is so not what you think it should be in a country that is the most modernized and most technologically sophisticated. Going into filing season 2022, the IRS had, why the cafeteria looked like this, is the IRS had over 10 million returns that had been backed up during COVID and that hadn't been processed, such that people were waiting for their returns or were waiting for their re returns to be processed or waiting for their refunds to receive, and the agency just fundamentally did not have the capacity to do this work. It has been remarkable to see what a difference just a year makes. This is the, I like the visual. So this is the IRS cafeteria in Austin as of April, um, a year later. What is great about what the agency has done already is it hired thousands of new people to process the unprocessed returns. 
It also achieved an 87% level of service, such that it, during this filing season, it only failed to answer 13% of calls that it, received, that it received. Last filing season, before the Inflation Reduction Act's investment in the agency, the IRS only answered 13% of the calls that it received. So that's pretty substantial progress. The agency helped in person over 100,000 more taxpayers this year than it did last year. And it's gearing up, including here in California, to pilot a direct e-file program where you can automatically file your tax returns with the IRS, uh, which will save taxpayers hundreds of dollars who, who are eligible, hundreds of dollars, and countless hours each year that they spend on tax preparation. So there's lots of progress um, and sort of meaningful progress, but there really is lots more to do. Uh, and as Mark mentioned, the IRS's tax gap totals about $680 billion annually. That's over $7 trillion left unaddressed over the course of the next decade. I think it's kind of hard to appreciate what does $7 trillion over the course of a decade, like what does that even mean? And so I tend to find some comparisons are useful. Uh, one year's worth of uncollected taxes totals about 3% of GDP. One year's worth of uncollected taxes would have covered an extension of the expanded child tax credit that lift mil lifted millions of children out of poverty through 2025. One year's worth of uncollected taxes would be sufficient by itself without doing anything else, without raising any other taxes would be sufficient to decrease our deficits by half. It's always struck me that there is just like a lot of low hanging fruit in the world of tax administration. And to be clear, our revenue needs are very significant in this country. Debt to GDP ratios are expected to reach over 130% over the course of the next decade. So finding ways to raise more revenue from tax reform has to be front, front of mind and first order, and perhaps we'll have some time to talk about that in the Q&A. But it has to be much easier, just like as a political lift, as an implementation lift, to collect the taxes that are already owed, especially when they're so significant. Doing so would also increase the efficiency of the economy, because today we're in a system where if you have two small business owners and one of them wants to fulfill their civic duty and be fully compliant with their tax obligations and another one doesn't, the Taxpayer who wants to comply, who is actively paying what they owe, is at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the taxpayer who's choosing to evade. And yet, despite the nature of the low-hanging fruit and despite the very significant revenue here and despite the gains to efficiency, over the course of the last decade before the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, the IRS was depleted such that it made doing exactly this work harder, not easier. And particularly, the IRS budget declined by over 20% in real terms over the course of a decade. What that meant was by 2019, the IRS had fewer complex revenue agents. Those are the type of people who can go out into the field and do audits of um, high income taxpayers or of complex partnerships. They had fewer of those people than the agency had had at any time since World War II. As a result, IRS audit scrutiny declined across the board, but it declined most exactly for those types of complex taxpayers where the tax bills are largest. And particularly, audit rates for multimillionaires declined by almost 80% over the course of this period. Partnership audit rates in the United States are basically 0%. The IRS opens about 7,500 audits of partnerships each year. It receives over 4 million partnership returns. In partnership is actually an area of extreme need for the agency, and I think it's helpful to kind of understand what the IRS is dealing with when it tries to audit a complex partnership. Pass-throughs are so named because income is taxed at the individual level as opposed to at the entity level. And you have partnerships that can evade taxes, for example, by assigning too little income to individuals. That's one way they could evade taxes. In order to make sure pass-throughs are ultimately, and pass-through owners are ultimately paying what they owe, 
what the IRS needs to do is it needs to unpack structures that look like this. And that's a pretty hard task. Pass-throughs can be owned by other pass-throughs that are owned by other pass-throughs that can be owned by foreigners and other corporations that ultimately there's some individual tax liability that sits. But tracing out something that looks like that if you are, and on average, the IRS has had a single revenue agent to assign to a case of a complex partnership, you can see why this has been an area that has been incredibly difficult for the agency to make progress, and is an area where, frankly, their audit rates have been literally zero. The agency knows that it's leaving money on the table. It's not like sort of sitting in the dark being like, oh, is there money here or is there not? It frankly just hasn't had the resources to invest in the people that it needs, but it also hasn't had the resources to invest in the technology that it needs. Partnerships are required to provide information to the IRS on K-1s about like ownership structures, but the IRS's IT is so old. The IRS's IT was developed, it's the oldest in the US government. It was developed in the 1950s. It has not been modernized since the 1950s, so it is literally written in COBOL, which is kind of hard from the IRS's perspective because Stanford computer scientists are not being taught COBOL anymore, so it's incredibly expensive to maintain. But what happens from the IRS's perspective is because its technology is so out of date, it's not able to match information that it receives on the one hand from partnerships about ownership stakes to information that it sees on the other hand about individuals on their individual tax return to try to determine if someone is sort of paying what they owe or potentially skirting their liabilities. So all that suggests that there is a lot of revenue to be had. And in previous work that I did at the Treasury Department, this is from some work that I did when I was in government, I estimated that the top 1% of the distribution is responsible for nearly 30% of unpaid taxes, or over $2 trillion over the course of the next decade. That's likely an underestimate Work by um, Daniel Reck and Gabriel Zuckman and co-authors at the IRS has suggested that the way that we come up with how much, how large the tax gap is, is through a series of random audits of taxpayers. And high income taxpayers have the capacity to hide their income even from a random audit. For example, by having a foreign bank account that's hard to find, uh, or by having income embedded in one of these complex pass-through structures. And as a result, we're probably understating even, and they kind of do some adjustments for this, they think the tax gap is understated by 10 to 15%, and that's coming disproportionately from the top of the distribution. I tend to say that we have a two-tiered tax system in this country, where for ordinary Americans who are wage earners, their taxes are automatically withheld from them, so they're fully compliant with their tax obligations. But for those who tend to make income in opaque ways, which is disproportionately those at the top of the distribution, they earn ways in, that are, earn income in ways that aren't as transparent to the IRS. So things like partnership income or things like proprietorship income, where rates of noncompliance are upwards of 50%. And so that suggests not just from a revenue perspective, but also from an equity perspective, there's a really substantial need to invest in the agency and invest in the agency's capacity. And that's actually what we just did. So on the one hand, that is like great news. Uh, this is from a paper that I wrote with Mark Mazur, the former Assistant Secretary of Tax Policy at the Treasury Department last spring, uh, where we considered what the likely revenue consequences were of the Inflation Reduction Act's substantial investment in the IRS. Uh, we concluded that it would result in about $560 billion of new revenue to the agency uh, over the course of a decade. And $560 billion is like a very significant sum, and we can talk about it in Q&A if it's of interest. It's also a much larger sum than official scorekeepers have estimated would arise from investing in the IRS. And the primary reason for our difference is because it turns out that taxpayer behavior adjusts really significantly to increased enforcement efforts. So when you watch your neighbor get audited or when you yourself get audited, you adjust your behavior accordingly such that you're more honest or more accurate in your filings going forward. And so when you account for this deterrent effect, you get a really substantial impact from investing in the IRS on the order of at least 
every dollar generates four to five dollars of additional revenue and likely more. Recent work by Nathan Hendren um, at Harvard and or at MIT now and co-authors suggest that the likely impact of investing one dollar into high-end enforcement is upwards of twelve dollars of additional revenue to the government. The fact that there's so much revenue that comes from the Inflation Reduction Act's investment in the IRS also means that there is much more revenue that is likely to be lost by Congress's attempts to defund the IRS. Um, and some of those attempts uh, have already gone forth in that in the debt ceiling agreement, there was a decision to rescind about $20 billion of the additional enforcement resources that the agency received in the Inflation Reduction Act. And we estimate that that is going to come at a cost of about $260 billion to the FISC over the course of the next decade. A question that I often get is like, how realistic are these numbers? Like, how reasonable? It kind of seems magical that like you can just like invest some in the IRS and generate hundreds of billions of dollars of additional revenue. And I think it's just helpful, and I'll close with this, just to understand these estimates in the context of the size of the problem that we're dealing with. The tax gap, like I said, is over $7 trillion over the course of the decade left unaddressed. And our estimates suggest that as a result of this like really substantial investment of, in the agency that allows it to modernize its technology, that allows it to hire a bunch of uh, experienced auditors with the capacity to unpack partnership returns or global high net worth returns, as a result of all that, what we're going to be able to do is capture about 7% of the tax gap over the course of the next decade. And to be sure, that's significant, and there's really significant revenue here. Uh, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility. It's meaningful progress, and it should be the first step in what the IRS is investing in. And Congress should give the agency, in my opinion, more resources, not fewer. And with that, I will keen for Q&A. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Natasha, for those remarks. Uh, so I think what we'll do is I'll ask a couple of questions, get one from the audience, ask one to alternate a little bit rather than just me going and the audience. So, uh, but just for starters, um, can you talk a little bit about, you mentioned, and I looked up some data before today, about what has happened to the IRS resources, uh, let's say since about 2010. Yeah. And according to the data that I found from CBO and OMB, inflation adjusted funding for the IRS fell by about 20%. What was interesting to me is it fell from 2010 to 17, and then it was actually flat from 2017 to 21, which was not what I would have expected if you had told me. Uh, so do you have a sense of like the legislative history? I know people don't love the IRS. I mean, <laughs> uh, maybe they're getting good ratings for answering people's calls, but it's, it's not people's favorite time of year, early April, for example. Yeah. So in any case, can you, can you walk us through a little bit? That, there, that? There's so much there in your question. So maybe I'll say a couple of things. One is, you're right that like, I, you know, if you're holding out for universal popularity for the IRS, that might be like a hard bet, right? In part because people don't love paying their taxes. But what they should appreciate, or some people don't, maybe some people do, but what people should appreciate is that the IRS is the largest administrator of federal benefits in the government. And by the way, over the course of that same period that you're describing, we added a new thing for the IRS to do because it implements substantial portions of health reform run through the IRS. And by the way, as we gave the agency no new resources at the start of COVID, what we asked them to do was be responsible for dispersing $1.5 trillion of critical lifelines to 88% of US families in the form of stimulus checks. We asked the agency to figure out how to sort of provide an advanced child tax credit for the first time in its history, where rather than giving people a child tax credit at the end of the year, it figured out how to do it on a monthly cadence for the period that that expansion was live. And so all that is to say that one of the things that I found like frustrating and hard, and maybe all of you can help me change uh, in some way, is Congress puts a, and policymakers in general, put a lot of demands on this agency. 
a lot that has to do with tax administration, and frankly, some that doesn't have to do with how we conventionally think of tax administration. Big chunks of the energy tax credits that are critical to our green transformation are running through the IRS. And this is the first time, they're pretty novel credits. They come with a whole set of requirements that the agency has been tasked with figuring out, again, without any specifically earmarked resources for doing that work. So I think part of what the agency needs to be better at, and those of us who think about tax administration need to be better at, is being clear that it kind of can't do everything with nothing. And when you saw that like set of like all of those paper returns that were piling up in Austin, in part what had happened as a result of COVID was the IRS was kind of like robbing Peter to pay Paul in that it had been tasked with doing all of this new stuff at the outset of the pandemic with respect to, for example, the checks. And in order to do that new stuff with no resources, what it essentially had to do was take away from some of the capacities that it had to do like going concern tax administration, like processing people's returns, and dedicate them to other parts of their mandate. And that isn't really a way to run a rodeo. And as we think about giving the IRS more and more to do, they're an incredibly talented workforce and kind of a remarkable set of people who have dedicated their lives to this critical mission. I think it's important for us to think about both the resources we give them to do that work, but also depoliticizing much of what the agency does in ways that will make it a more effective tax administrator and a more effective government agency. So something you just said, this is not one of the questions that I have, but just made me wonder about like recruitment for the agency. I think a big issue just in government generally totally. is how do you get like really smart, motivated people to want to go serve? And the IRS is obviously going to be up against some very sophisticated, totally. like, right? So can you talk a little bit about, is there anything that, that the IRS can do, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act or anything else, that is going to encourage people, you know what I mean, to want to go there. And you mentioned like COBOL programming. Uh, my dad, who just turned 88 this past weekend, he did COBOL programming in the Federal Reserve System for a lot of years. And he could still, he could probably go down to the IRS, <laughs> help them unpack their COBOL. He'd be very excited. Doing Let me active go down there. recruitment right uh, now. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, so, I, I mean, I hesitate to even say like, is the agency doing anything with like AI? Right, because you're out here in Silicon Valley, we hear about AI, there's just a lot of excitement about all these great things that AI is going to unlock. And then you've got the IRS, which as you said, is this hugely important government agency running on COBOL. So I don't know, can you just like recruiting, tech, totally. like the whole, it, it, just, it just seems like a long, and it, it's not even just money, it's yeah. just regs. So can you talk a little bit about that? So I think that this is like so interesting and front of mind as you think about the IRS and the agency, which is not just, you're totally correct, it's like not just about money. And recruiting the federal government is like a hard thing to do baseline, even if you're not the IRS, because there's a whole set of rules, right? There are like all these restrictions about what you can pay people and restrictions about the ways in which that they can work. And there's all this time that it takes in order to get someone in the door because of all of the various steps about the security clearance. It's just like a process that is laborious. And on top of that, I will say, I'm a little optimistic about all this as I'm telling you all these bad things. On top of that, the IRS has been like literally the one of the hardest places to work in the government for the last decade plus. And it's been one of the hardest places to work in. The, when you walk around these submission processing centers and you talk about your 80 billion, and like this was before it had passed, right? So we were like hoping for 80 billion dollars. The, the people at the IRS kind of understandably were like a little skeptical of the enterprise, in part because they were like, we've kind of heard this before. It is not a new concept that you want to fund the agency so it can do better on this whole host of do better on the tax gap, do better on serving taxpayers. It just never actually has happened. It's also the case that they were the sort of number one complaint that you had. It wasn't like it would be great if we could have AI. It was like our chairs are broken and we can't kind of afford to fix one of the tables so that we can all sit and have lunch in the cafeteria. 
And so we were talking about an agency that had been so decimated that as you're thinking about going out to recruit partnership experts and asking them to t take substantial pay cuts, like who wants to work in that environment? And who wants to work in an environment where it's not clear they might have money to pay you this year because of what Congress decided to appropriate them, but it's totally unclear if they're gonna have money next year because like the way the federal government funds itself is crazy town, right? It's like one year they do this and then the next year they do that and it's like there could be no consistency across the different components. And so part of why I'm optimistic is like if you are someone who is excited about public service, of which there are many in this room who I know, so like there's a lot of people who are excited about public service, and you're someone who has a particular set of expertise with respect to let's say partnerships or let's say global multinational corporations, there is going to be literally nowhere more interesting to work than a well-resourced IRS. Because the kind of work that you're gonna to get to do at a relatively early career stage, relative to going and doing work in the private sector, they literally will not compare. Additionally, the agency is finally in the place where it has at least, and I hope it stays, and that part of what keeps me up at night is like, I really wonder what the rescissions are gonna look like, I wonder what the political environment is that the IRS is gonna be operating in in the years ahead, we have an election coming up, these things are worrying. But for now, the agency is in a place where it has a stability of funding, it's in a place where it has a very clear mandate, and it's in a place where it's being pretty creative as it thinks about recruitment efforts. So a thing I didn't know before I went to go work in government, many of you may know, is that big accounting firms have mandatory retirement forced on their partners around the age of 60. So there is a pool of people with a ton of skill, like your dad, ton of skill, many years left to productively work and who would be excited about the opportunity to get to culminate their career in a way that is public service facing. And so I do think that there are opportunities that the IRS is already working to leverage and is gonna be able to continue to leverage, but I don't wanna understate the challenge, but also I don't wanna understate the tremendous opportunity because it's pretty exciting. I mean, it just, it does make me think, this is not at all the direction I thought I was gonna go here, but just, uh, it makes me think, like when you walk around Stanford, Okay, and you see all these amazing titans of industry in the past who have given buildings like Bill Gates and yeah. uh, um, I don't know Hewlett Packard, what, what, all 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 over this place who have who have given to engineer who have engaged industry engaging with universities totally. to try to help figure out how the places can do things that are more helpful. So I, I don't know if if IRS is proactively reaching out to all these policy schools that are growing and totally. starting and lost. Anyway, that's just a, a different direction. But um, okay, so one thing that you've, the way that you've talked about things so far has sort of raised things as somewhat of a zero and one issue with taxes being owed or not owed. There's like a lot of gray area. So I'll just give you like a really simple example from my own personal experience this past <laughs> this this uh this earlier this year i drove my i rode my bike down to the high school i don't know event that was happening at my daughter's high school where you could donate your bike cool. right so i donated my bike and when i do if and when i do my well when i do my taxes in early 2024 <laughs> okay. and i do sit down taxes. like what was that bike worth i probably i'm not going to even list it just because but but <laughs> Do you, but there's this question of, should you list it 100, 200, 300? Like, and this is obviously a simple cartoon-like example, but there is this question of kind of a pushing the envelope. There's no one right number yeah. to declare for that, but should it be what I paid for it five years ago? Should it be like, so can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's got to be huge. And it's interesting. When I talk about, when I talk about the tax gap and I talk about the distribution of the tax gap. I'm really focused on and what the tax gap estimates are capturing is they're capturing like outright evasion. So they're capturing like you, we went back and we took a subset of taxpayers and we randomly audited them. And we look at post audit what we what their tax liability was, and we compare it to pre pre audit what they reported. And the difference between the two, we do some adjustments. Not all auditors are created equal. We do some adjustments. We basically come up with a tax gap. 
what you're not capturing there, and frankly, may very well be more relevant as we talk about the world of multinational corporations or the world of partnerships or the world of highly sophisticated, high net worth individuals, is the gray. Gray. Right? right? So you, what you're not capturing is avoidance that is legal up to a point. And the difference between what counts is we think about them and when we teach them, when I teach them to my students, I teach them as two very different concepts. I say like evasion is like you break the law and avoidance is like you do the stuff that's within the bounds of the law. We might find some of it icky, but it's like fully within the bounds of the law. The reality is the difference between those two things is like a spectrum, not like a sort of two clear buckets. And so part of the challenge from the IRS, and they actually, this was a big deal for them, they actually just issued to Microsoft, they've been arguing with Microsoft for many years about a series of cases that relate to booking profits in Puerto Rico uh, and the nature of whether or not what they claimed they had sold their Puerto Rican subsidiary was actually worth what it was. So it was like an, it was an argument about a totally legal avoidance strategy. But the question was, had they accurately valued what they had placed in this tax haven? And what the IRS concluded was the answer is no, and that Microsoft owes $39 billion in back taxes for a period of about a decade. To give you a sense of how significant $39 billion is, it is the entire measured corporate tax gap. Granted, not apples to apples, because we're talking about 10 years in one year, but like it is a huge sum of money. And part of why these resources are so important is because for a really long time, as you looked at sophisticated corporations and as you looked at high net worth people who have at their disposal a ton of resources to hire tax advisors, what you had was like essentially no penalty for pushing the rules really far. Because there was an understanding that like, listen, the IRS has like zero money and zero people. So they're not really gonna have any capacity to look at this. And what has changed from the agency's perspective and why I think this like deterrence factor, taxpayer behavior matters so significantly is even before they've started much of this work, there is a very clear sign that has been posted, which is we are going to look and that is just a fundamentally different place to be. And it matters not just for the measured tax gap that is like the clear evasion numbers. It matters for tax compliance and taxpayer behavior more broadly in ways that I think are really important. OK, great. I'm gonna, I have like a million questions that I can ask. I'm going to ask one, and then I'm going to open it up. So please get your questions ready. Um, so it is the case, I believe, that in about two years, there will be some quite significant, mainly cuts, tax changes that are going to expire, absent any changes in policy. Um, so this is a different, this is getting, this is tapping into not just your IRS expertise here, obviously, but your sort of deputy assistant secretary for economic policy, because that's gonna be, I think, kind of a big deal. It'll yeah. depend a little bit on what's happening 11 months from now, but who, who, where, which direction it will go. But can you talk a little bit about what you think is coming down the pike there? Yeah. So I think it is, a, it is both like an exciting moment and a terrifying moment, I guess. It's an exciting moment in that both Democrats and Republicans have been pretty clear. What Mark is referring to, big chunks of the Trump tax cuts are set to expire in 2025. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, Tax right? Cuts TCGA, and Jobs TCGA, Act, TCJA. TCJA. Yeah. Big pieces set to expire. Those include across-the-board cuts to individual income tax rates. Both the Democrats and Republicans have signaled an interest in extending at least a portion of those expiring cuts. And so the question is really, so the exciting but terrifying thing, the exciting thing is that the tax code is going to be reopened. Like, I guarantee it. It will be reopened before the end of 2025. The question is what happens then? And the thing that is terrifying is that we already are facing a pretty bleak deficit picture. The debt to GDP ratios, if you assume that all the Trump tax cuts actually expire, debt to GDP is going to rise to 119% in the next decade. If you don't assume they're going to expire and you just assume they're going to be extended, unfunded, so just deficit increases, it's going to rise to 133%. 
And by the way, we are now, and this is Mark's area, one of Mark's many areas of expertise, we are now less than a decade out from the extingu extinguishment of the Social Security Trust Fund and of Medicare trust funds. And so in less than a decade, we're not gonna be able to pay out beneficiaries in whole unless something changes with respect to how the law and how the programs operate. So like our revenue needs are super significant. And we have a moment that is coming when we're gonna reopen the tax code. So it gives us a chance to think seriously about trying to meet some of those revenue needs. And I have a piece that I just wrote with Kim Clossing for the Hamilton Project where we try to make the case for thinking beyond, thinking about this as a tax reform moment that's beyond just the Trump tax cuts. Because what should be on the table, frankly, is revisiting corporate rates. What should be on the table is thinking seriously about Pillar 2 and international tax reform. Because by the way, the rest of the world has moved. The rest of the world will be, multinationals will face a minimum tax of 15%. The question is just whether the United States is gonna reap any of that revenue, and we certainly should. What, will also, what should also be on the table is expanding the child tax credit and making it fully refundable so that the most vulnerable families are lifted out of poverty. And we can pay for all of this. And we can pay for it in part, by the way, to bring us all back. We can pay for it in part by adequately funding the IRS and reversing some of the rescissions that we've seen because, again, there's a lot of revenue here. Okay, great. Well, I am going to open it up for some questions. Uh, for, thank you for, for, for that, for some questions from the audience. Well, let's start right back here. Let's give him, let's uh, get, get a microphone and if you can just uh, state your name and yeah. Yeah, I'm Adam Starr. I'm an MBA at the GSB. In the world where we continue to increase investment in the IRS and marginal cost of enforcement equals marginal revenue of tax income, What's the non-compliance look like there? Totally. How much fraud exists? Totally. So you're raising like, a, it's interesting. I didn't get a chance to talk much, but I will now, about the relationship between my, our estimates of how much revenue can be raised by this 80 billion and what official scorekeepers have said, the CBO and JCT have said about the same question. And part of the difference between our estimates has to do with exactly your question which is that JCT assumes much more, CBO actually is scoring dollars to the IRS, assumes much more significant diminishing returns to new dollars spent. And to be clear, I've been talking a lot about like the size of the tax gap, it's $7 trillion, that's huge, it's like 3% of GDP on an annualized basis. You might intuit from that that I'm saying we should go after every last dollar of noncompliance. Of course, that's not true because there are diminishing marginal returns to pursuing that very last dollar. It's really costly to pursue that very last dollar of noncompliance. And so where are we with respect to diminishing returns and how likely are we to hit diminishing returns in the near future as a result of these investments? And the thing that I find frustrating about, and I found frustrating, frankly, I have scorekeepers, by the way, and that's like a longer topic than we're gonna have time for today, but do God's work, because it is hard to try and think about the revenue effects of all of these different types of programs and policies and tax reform proposals. But a thing that I found frustrating is that the sort of estimates of diminishing marginal returns and how likely we are to face diminishing marginal returns for the next dollar expended on the IRS they never adjusted in the face of the fact that the IRS's budget decreased by 20% over the course of a decade. They don't reflect the fact that the agency's capacity to do partnership audits right now is 0%. And so my long-winded answer to you is I don't know exactly where diminishing returns are but I do know that we are really, really far from them. And so as we came up with, you might ask, by the way, like how did you come up with $80 billion or why $80 billion, why not $800 billion, like what's the number? It was less about diminishing marginal returns, which again, I think we're very far from, and more about what the IRS's absorption capacity really is. Because you have to think about how realistic is it that the agency is gonna be able to deploy these resources in an efficient way quickly, and how quickly can it scale up its capacities? And our conclusion at the time, working with our colleagues at the IRS, was like, you can maybe grow by like 10 to 15% a year, maybe, 
And so that's kind of how we derived these estimates. It was less a concern that eventually you would give them some amount of money such that they would no longer be able to use it productively because I think we're pretty far from that. Okay, so, oh, we've got a lot of questions now. I was gonna, okay, Becky, why don't you go right here in the, uh, right here. Uh, Professor Lester, I'm sorry, anyway. The, right, uh, Mike? I wanted to ask about the international tax competition and the international tax landscape. I'd be interested in your um, more perspective on OECD's pillar two and the global minimum tax. Totally. Um, what you think the what your prediction would be about the U.S. adopting that or not? Um, and I mean, a very technical piece how that interacts with things like guilty, but more broadly, just what's going to happen if the U.S. doesn't actually pass the global minimum tax? Where does that leave us five years from now? So. Like, and that is a great series of questions and I'm so excited you asked them. And maybe before I answer them, I'll give like one sentence of big picture. In 2021, for those of you who don't know, the secretary negotiated or led a series of negotiations that culminated in an agreement b between about 95% of the world's economy, uh, including the US, to go forth with a global minimum tax that would set a floor with respect to the taxes that multinationals would face no matter what jurisdiction they were operating in because you cover 95% of the global economy. And I will say that to, and the art, the idea, by the way, is like quite sound because right now it's huge incentive to like shift your profits to tax havens because even post the Trump tax reform, which had guilty in it, which thought tried to engage seriously with the question of international uh, taxation, what it left is it left kind of the U.S. in a place where it was disadvantaged relative to both high tax and low tax jurisdictions. Because the nature of how the tax system operates today is that you can kind of get credit for booking income in some high tax jurisdictions and use it against the fact that you are book, still booking income in tax havens, which are operating at much lower than any 15% rate, often close to a 0% rate. So the global tax deal was like a huge deal. Ultimately, it as it pains me. It was like this, and from tr the Treasury's perspective, kind of the two things that you were most enthusiastic about trying to get in to build back better, which then become became the Inflation Reduction Act, were the OECD implementing the Pillar 2 of the OECD global minimum tax deal and the IRS funding. So like the thing that got left on the kitchen floor, because ultimately there were a few senators who didn't want the United States to be a first mover, that's what happened worried that that would put the US at a competitive disadvantage because who knew what the rest of the world was. Sure, everyone had this agreement, but who knew what the rest of the world was gonna do? We didn't pass it. And what has happened as a result of that decision is the rest of the world has gone forth with implementing against the agreement. So in the EU, in South Korea, in Japan, in Canada, there are going to be global minimum taxes. And the way that the international deal was structured was pretty smart in that there's also a penalty that multinationals face for being headquartered in a tax haven. And if the US chooses not to implement against Pillar 2, then we get to be a tax haven. And the penalty is such that you're, you're a French, you're a US multinational, you have a French subsidiary, as a result of avoiding paying the global 15% minimum tax on your global income, what the French subsidiary can, what can happen in France is your French subsidiary can be charged a penalty, it's called the UTPR, it can be charged a penalty for having, for operating in a tax haven jurisdiction. So that's why I said that the revenue is going, the multinationals are going to pay, and pillar two is like pretty far gone at this point. The question is whether the US is going to reap any of the revenue. And I think ultimately, the part of what is exciting about 2025 is we are going to revisit this question in a serious way. And I don't want to get ahead of like, and what, first of all, not like get ahead. I am so outside my bailiwick when I talk about political dynamics because I like deeply don't understand them even after having it. What Washington taught me is that I understand them even less than I thought I did. But I think one thing that is true is that multinationals today face an array of very complicated different minimum taxes, right? So there's guilty, there's beat, there's fitty, there's now this new corporate alternative minimum tax on their book income. And so I have wondered whether the multinationals themselves might be interested in a more cohesive approach to minimum taxation 
that includes some trades to try to simplify the world and also create a system that is Pillar 2 compliant. And I think there's a way to do that, and Kim and I talk about it a little bit in our paper. Kim is a recent speaker at a CEPR policy forum on tax policy, so yeah. Did she do yeah. climate? I can't remember. I'm sorry, <laughs> I should know. I don't think she did climate. Do climate that's the other actually. thing I didn't get I think to she say. Did interna I think she did the Carbon taxes. All right, carbon taxes, okay. That's, that you, we'll have you back for a different yeah, one on that. Okay, another uh, question right, right here in the front row. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ritesh Chandan. I run for US Congress. So my question is like uh, when the uh, IRS, they don't have money to even fix the uh, table chairs. Uh, the new things like Bitcoin, the new structure which is coming up, which is a source of revenue to tax people, and how they, they manage that? Yeah. So it's actually a super interesting area. And I didn't get a chance to say at the outset, when we think about the tax gap, it's 600, $700 billion annually. Uh, commissioner Reddick, Charles Reddick, who was the Trump appointed IRS commissioner who served for much of my time when I was in government because the nature of the commissioner's terms is there five years, um, he often made the point that he thought that the tax gap was like woefully underestimated in part because we have no, and he gave a number, he was like, I think it's more like a trillion dollars. And you know, whether the number is a trillion, whether it's 900 billion, whether it's 1.5 trillion, like no one really knows in part because the areas of greatest challenge for the agency are these like emerging sectors that it doesn't really know anything about. So like digital assets, it has like no comprehension of no, the size of the market, how many transactions are happening. And until very recently, there was no third party reporting, even now there's no third party reporting, but we have legislation that calls for it, so soon there will be. There was no third party reporting on any of those types of transactions to the agency, so it had no way of knowing whether people were adequately fulfilling their tax obligations, and taxpayers had no way of knowing, no way of tracking what their tax obligations even were supposed to be. So all that is like a long-winded way of saying, I think that there, it is hard from the IRS's perspective, and it's not just about resources, it's also about capacity and skill to learn about these new emerging areas of compliance challenge. And part of what, and you, Mark was asking about AI, I will say part of what the IRS is investing in as it looks to build up its workforce is at the very top of the agency, it's trying to think seriously about exactly those areas of challenge. And it's trying to poach, frankly, from the private sector, people who have expertise in AI, who have expertise in significant call center advancements that the private sector is already implemented against because the knowledge exists. It's just like, how do you take those technologies and bring them into a government ecosystem, which is super hard to do, but how do you do that? Not like inventing from first principles. So I have a quick question for you on, that you kind of touched on in one of your uh, answers, which is just the complexity of the tax code, which seems to grow every year. And I guess that just gives people in DC, something to work on, like this is gonna be my thing this year, I'm gonna add another 14 pages to the tax code, and, and it's just incredible. Like I was looking at the trajectory of the number of pages totally. in the US tax code over the last 20, 25 years, and it's just up. And so that, I think, must create, make it even harder for the IRS to do its job, and maybe it's, optimal because the world is getting more complicated, and if the world is getting more complicated, taxes perhaps need to, but I don't know, it just seems horribly, horribly complicated. Do you have, is there any hope for the agency to simplify? Is that something, like in 2025, yeah. when they open up the tax code, is that something, I mean, people maybe talk about it, but people like to have their, their thing, right? Like, I added this thing to the tax code as opposed to taking things away. So I am, I'm working on a project around 2025 tax reform, which is why I'm very excited about it, um, with Larry Summers, uh, Fred Goldberg, who's a former IRS commissioner, uh, and Les Samuels, who's a former assistant secretary for tax policy. And our sort of objective is to pool resources from the tax practitioner community academics, we like think about tax policy, but we don't like interact with the code in any real way, like on the ground. Whereas practitioners, they sort of experience the code and its weaknesses and its strengths in a way that's like fundamentally distinct from anything I could ever aspire to do. 
And so the goal a little bit is to connect the practitioner community with the policymaking community in Washington in advance of 2025, because I think there is going to be this moment. And part of what's been super interesting about these conversations is that one of the first pillars, you might think the pillars should be like revenue raising and the pillars should be like progressivity and distribution. One of the first pillars that has like come to the fore, it's a bipartisan group um, of tax, primarily tax practitioners and, and experts in the code, is tax simplification. Because the reality is like, and it's not just like the code is get more and more complex because people put in their like preferences for this type of farm or for this type of this county or and that's why there's so much complexity in the code. It's that the rules are so archaic and so with respect to things like the EITC, the rules are, the family structure rules are so highly complicated that if I gave them to all of you, maybe many of you are tax experts, so maybe you would know, but you would struggle to figure out like, okay, so am I eligible, am I not? What about for the child tax credit? Like, did I have my kid for long enough in a year? And so the nature of the complexity is not just that it creates difficulty from the IRS for an implementation perspective. What I worry about like normatively is I think it dissuades people from getting access to all that they're entitled to. And I think simplification is actually like a crucial component of being able to make sure both that the system can run effectively, but also that taxpayers get entitled to get access to all that they're entitled to from the code. Okay, well, we're running short on time. I like Anat. Why don't you go ahead? But uh, yeah, yeah. And then Mark, you have a question too. Maybe these two are back to back. So Anat then Mark. Thank you, Anat Mati from the Business School. Uh, just quickly, uh, this is a big topic, but. Um, I was going to ask about nonprofits, but let's leave that aside. I'll instead uh, ask about, uh, you know, ProPublica published all these, uh, you know, just how much taxes does, you know, Warren Buffett or Bezos pay. Yeah. And so the big elephant in the room, and it's not in the Supreme Court, is but unrealized gains. And that's, again, ignoring carried interest and all the other stuff. So what about, and I mean, that's some of the richest people in the country paying being able to do this sort of buy, borrow, die thing, yeah. or maybe borrow, buy, die, whatever order, <laughs> uh, but basically living off, you know, a lot of stock that's not realized and being able to borrow to generate a, a, and then taking a dollar in income, et cetera. And then Mark, and then you're going to try to answer both, by, like, the, so they may be two completely different, but you can, you remember. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Mark Wolfson, also from the Business School. And actually, uh, Mark Mazur was an old student of mine. I was oh, on this dissertation committee. Oh, he told me earlier committee. today, he said, say hi to GSB for me. So uh, I'm so <laughs> thrilled. So let me preface uh, my question with a statement that I'm strongly in favor of increasing the budget for the IRS. You know, everyone, as I listen to all these questions, everyone has their own favorite uh, area that is their hot button on the tax side. But many of the questions I'm hearing really relate more to avoidance than, ev than evasion. And uh, even, you know, Mark, many of, many of uh, you know, Mark's questions about complexity, most of that, the, the technical needs the IRS have, has, has more to do with the avoidance side than the evasion mm -hmm. side. And part of the challenge is that the service has difficulty locating where the evasion is. Totally. And so often what appears to be the lowest hanging fruit is to some degree exploiting power, to some degree going after what they can, and it ends up in practice being more on the avoidance side. Mm -hmm. And the challenge with that is that, and th this is just a you know, suggestion for you to consider in preserving credibility and making the case for a bigger budget, but the so-called tax gap is always stated as a gross number, and it's never netted against the deadweight cost associated with where most of the funds are actually being spent, which is auditing avoidance, which imposes very substantial costs totally. on taxpayers, totally. just in part of the audit process of avoidance. So Mark made a wonderful suggestion about the potential for AI to do a better job identifying where the evasion's likely to be located based on 
you know, the, the actual cumulative, you know, evidence and, and work that the service does. I think that has benefits not only for revenues collected, but also the perceived fairness and the net tax gap, which should subtract yep. the costs imposed on taxpayers who are the subject of audits. So you have negative two minutes to Negative respond. two minutes. So, well, good luck. <laughs> these are, um, what should Bezos pay is like a first order question for society. And I will say that I want to say a couple of things. One is not referred to a case that's before the Supreme Court right now called Moore versus the United States. Uh, at issue at the case in the case is a pretty obscure provision of the 2017 tax reform uh, tax cuts and jobs act, which has to do with foreign ownership stakes uh, and attack one time repatriation or transition tax on those foreign ownership stakes. It is being levied not because of there's substantial revenue at stake. Apple paid $38 billion as a result of this repatriation tax. It matters. But the real reason that the case is being brought is because conservative advocacy groups are trying to use it as a vehicle to preemptively force the court to engage with questions about the constitutionality of wealth taxation or the constitutionality of the taxation of unrealized capital gains. Uh, I want to be clear that, that the court should not use this as a vehicle. It's the wrong case to be thinking about those issues. The case should be very easily decided against the petitioners, but that's exactly what's happening. And this is going to be like the fundamental question of sort of how much revenue can be raised is a fundamental question is like how much can you get right there at the top. I will say that I think that there is, I, I'm not sure exactly what the right approach to the taxation of capital income is, but I know that our approach in this country today is deeply broken. You have not just the fact that you can buy, borrow, die, if you're Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, you also have the fact that when you pass on, when you do die, and you pass on your appreciated capital gains to your heirs, by the way, their basis resets, they're never going to pay tax on any of that. And so it seems like totally bonkers. And it seems like something that sort of as a matter of equity and as a matter of revenue, we should be able to find ways to address. What those ways precisely are, I think the political process is going to have to work to a system. And what exactly the right rate is, again, the political process is going to have to work to a system. But we are nowhere close, like we're nowhere close to diminishing returns. We are nowhere close when the effective tax rate on the Forbes 400 is 8%. That's lower than when you take into account their unrealized capital gains. That's lower than the tax rate that's faced by low and middle income Americans in this country who earn wage income. That like has to be deeply wrong and is a problem for democracy. It's not just a problem for tax. Um, on that is so I am so worried about the fact that we don't have a good understanding of the cost to taxpayers of enforcement activities. And by the way, it's it's you're totally right that it is about this like avoidance evasion set of questions, but it also relates to what you talked about with Dan Ho's research, which is part of what happens with respect to correspondence audits is from the IRS's perspective, the way that the agency thinks about auditing EITC recipients is it thinks it's like a low cost activity for them because they're like sending out a form. So it's like doesn't cost them anything. And that is like Again, it's just like the wrong way to think about the cost of enforcement activities because you have to think about the costs that are borne by the taxpayer, which aren't just the direct cost of dealing with the enforcement activity. It's also the fear and the pain that comes from actually being caught up in one of these enforcement activities. And so I do think that there's a lot of room for the IRS to develop on these dimensions. AI is obviously going to be a very substantial part of the solution, but it's not like super fancy AI that the Silicon Valley folks are developing, it is literally like developing the capacity to compare a taxpayer to themselves over time or a taxpayer to a similarly situated taxpayer, like things that grad students do with Stata like very easily with very large data sets. It's that type of capacity that the IRS needs, which they don't have today. So they're not making efficient enforcement decisions. They're like throwing a dart in blind throwing a dart at a wall and like hoping something sticks and that's not a way to run a rodeo. Wow, okay, well with that, please join me in thanking Professor Saren for coming.